Okay, good morning. Good morning and welcome to CSIS. Uh, my name is Matthew Goodman. I'm the Simon Chair in Political Economy here at CSIS. Delighted to see a, a good crowd on a, on a rainy Wednesday morning. Appreciate your coming out and uh, shout out also to our online viewers. We know we have a, a loyal following online and I'm delighted to have you. You can follow us on Twitter at CSIS. Um, so, um, we had about a little over a year ago, Prime Minister Abe here at CSIS, and he uh, said, Japan is back. And uh, I think that this uh, event is a uh, clear recognition that that is the case. Uh, certainly, Japan is back in terms of the interest in Japan uh, here in Washington, and uh, generally, and so the audience here reflects that. Uh, but clearly, up on Capitol Hill as well, there is renewed interest in Japan. And the fact that um, earlier this year, uh, I think officially on March 24th, uh, the two congressmen who were about to meet uh, co-established a Japan caucus, a U.S.-Japan caucus, uh, for the first time, apparently, uh, up on the Hill, uh, um, is a real uh, sign that there is tremendous interest in Japan on all fronts, uh, economic, security, political. And uh, so this is a very exciting opportunity to hear from uh, our uh, Congressional Caucus on uh, U.S.-Japan Relations, and uh, so let me just uh, introduce them, and then we'll get started. Um, on, uh, I'm not, not going to say directions here because it always gets you in trouble on the left, right, center, uh, but at the far furthest from me is, uh, uh, um, is Congressman David Nunes of um, California. He's a Republican who's been in the House since 2003. Um, he is uh, the chairman of the House Ways and Means Trade Subcommittee, um, and he is also on the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. Uh, and so uh, he is um, the uh, Republican co-chair of the caucus. And then next to him is uh, Congressman Joaquin Castro of Texas. He is a Democrat who uh, entered Congress in 2013. Uh, he sits on both the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee and um, uh, the Armed Services Committee in the House, and uh, he is the Democratic uh, co-chair of this committee. It's a bipartisan uh, caucus, and uh, they're going to tell you more, I think, about why it was founded and what it's going to be aiming to do. Uh, uh, next to me is Mike Green, my colleague here at CSAS, who is the senior uh, vice president for Asia and the Japan chair here at CSAS, and uh, he's going to moderate the discussion. So I'll stop and turn it over to Mike. <clears throat> Great. Thank you, uh, Matthew, and thank you uh, both for joining us. One more thing. Please turn off cell phones and noisemakers. Thank you. Um, thank you for coming out. Very rainy day. Um, it, I want to ask a couple of questions and, and get the dialogue going, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, but let me first ask about the caucus itself. As, as Matthew said, um, surprisingly, there hasn't been a U.S.-Japan uh, caucus in the Congress. Um, despite the fact that there are for many, if not most, of our leading allies and trade partners. Um, why is there this caucus now? What do you want to achieve? And I'm also interested for each of you personally, sort of what hooked you on Japan and what got you interested in this. It's not like you don't have a lot of other things in your day job. So sure. why don't we start with that? Congressman Nunez? Well, thank you. <clears throat> really, it was because of Japan's interest in becoming part of the, the normal trading regime, I think. And uh, we know that as uh, uh, Abe was here last year, uh, he's really reaching out to globally, trying to make changes in Japan. Uh, the joke was, as, as many of the folks that, that followed Japan closely, is we couldn't even remember who the prime minister was because it just kept changing so often. And so we're, I think, with, with, the, with kind of the steady hand of the Abe government, looking towards TPP, looking at trying to, to create a WTO plus uh, type of environment uh, for trade and, and economic growth uh, was really a reason why uh, there's this renewed interest in Japan once Japan decided to get into the TPP. And uh, Joaquin and I uh, decided that we needed to increase Japan's presence uh, in the capital. And there's been surprising number uh, turnout with, uh, I think we have close to 70 members of Congress who have joined the, the Japan caucus. And I'm, so I'm excited about it. And I think that uh, if we can, over the next few years, if we can implement these, these two big trade agreements, both TPP and the EU agreement, uh, it really is going to change the way that uh, we create economic development all over the globe. Great. Thank you. 
Uh, well, first of all, thank you to uh, the center for hosting this, and thank you to Matthew and yourself for being part of it. Um, you know, Japan is, uh, and Japanese companies are very important to the U.S. economy, uh, and that is true throughout the United States. And uh, part of the reason that I was drawn to starting this caucus with Devin is because in San Antonio, we have uh, a large uh, Toyota plant, uh, the sixth North American manufacturing plant for Toyota. Uh, they just announced the movement of a few thousand more jobs to Texas. Uh, and Toyota is just one example of a Japanese company that's employing thousands of Americans uh, in San Antonio and, and in Texas. Uh, so there's a very strong relationship there. But I should also say that San Antonio, like other American cities, uh, started the relationship with Japan uh, not recently, but years ago. One of the reasons that Japan found San Antonio a hospitable place uh, for that plant is because in the 1980s, uh, we had started a very deep relationship with Japan and have a sister city in Kumamoto. Uh, and so there's been this long bilateral relationship between our two cities. Um, you know, there's been a congressional study group on Japan that Di Diane DeGette is part of, and I think she heads up. Uh, and they've done incredible work over the years. Uh, our, ours was an attempt to formalize this into a caucus. Uh, and if you look at the membership of it, as Devin mentioned, it's almost 70 strong and still growing, and we just got started. Uh, but it's bipartisan, and it also represents it's people that represent uh, places from throughout the United States. And, and, and your brother is mayor. My brother so is it's mayor. A family, it's a family oh, yeah. thing. We're <laughs> twins, but I'm the better looking twin. Good, good. <laughs> and that was on the record. That's on good. the record, yeah. <clears throat> um, it's interesting, you know, 25 years ago in the Congress, first of all, uh, the Japan account was very partisan. <clears throat> um, and second, when people uh, were asked in opinion polls in 1988, 89, uh, what's a bigger threat, the Soviet Union's nuclear weapons or Japan's economy, guess who won? I mean, people thought that the Japan's economy was a bigger threat. And today, it's a big change. I mean, there's very strong bipartisanship on Asia policy generally and on Japan. And there's a sense that uh, a growing, vibrant Japanese economy that's part of the um, global trading system um, helping us uh, build rules is a, is a plus. So there's a lot of runway. There's a lot of room to do things with this caucus. <clears throat> um, the president just came back from an important trip to Asia, including a state visit in Japan. And as I understand it, the largest number of uh, CODELs, of congressional delegations, in some 20, 30 years to Japan. How do you look at the the trips, uh, particularly the president's trip, we'll start with Congressman sure. Castro. Well, I think it was a success. Uh, you know, the president has talked about his Asia policy, and really, when you think about his foreign policy, this pivot to Asia is one of the hallmarks of that policy. Uh, and he had a chance, very importantly, to reassure uh, countries like Japan, but also South Korea and the Philippines, uh, about the American commitment to their security, uh, which is obviously very important for those nations, uh, but also very important for our influence in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, and of course, as everybody here knows, um, you know, you're talking about, in that region, two of the nation's largest five economies, three of the nation's largest 15 economies, uh, so, and, and continuing to grow. Uh, so it's very important that the United States have a very strong and steady hand uh, in the region. And I think the President's trip uh, reaffirmed that and went a long way to strengthen it. Well, as you'll, you'll find out that in Congress we have, you know, really, differing views, and, and I have a, a little bit of a different view on the President's trip. Uh, I thought it was, uh, it, it's, it's really been a mistake that we have not passed trade promotion authority. Uh, and you know, I think the President and some folks had uh, some type of hope that they could close out the TPP agreement when they were there. Uh, and I think that was a, 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 a bad mistake. And I think that until we pass Trade Promotion Authority in the Congress, I think we really give USTR a, a weak hand to play as they're negotiating out the TPP. So uh, there has been a lot of attention paid to the region. It's important uh, that congressional uh, delegations go there. It's important that the president went there. And it's important, I think, that the president laid out some real security uh, a kind of a security platform uh, as it relates to some of the issues in the, in the uh, South China Sea. But I think that as you look forward here, you're going to have to have uh, trade promotion authority because if we, we can have all the defense and intelligence uh, <laughs> linkages that we want, uh, but if we don't have those economic ties, it makes it very tough. And when you have Japan who's really trying to change their, the, the dynamics of their economy, 
uh, and, and are willing to do what they've never been able to do. You go back to 1988, the reason why was because they, had, they kind of had a closed economy and they were just crushing on the, on the global market, which it worked for a while, but it's not working anymore for Japan. Uh, and so ultimately, economics plays out and Japan has seen that they need to join the world's economy, as China has also seen. Uh, and so I just feel that, that the president would have, would have really made a big splash had trade promotion authority already been passed in the Congress and we would be looking at getting down to the end of negotiating TPP. But unfortunately, I think we're still stuck at the beginning. It's, uh, it's hard for <clears throat> the, the, you know, we have a federal system, Japan has a parliamentary system. Uh, the, the, the prime minister can, knows if he can deliver his caucus. <clears throat> but on the US side, our trading partners don't know um, if the president can deliver until there's some test of that. Um, and the TPA is that test. Of course, TPA, um, you know, even with TPA, trade agreements aren't safe with Korea. Uh, most recently, um, pretty much every trade agreement we've done in the last decade, even after TPA, there were two, three mulligans and do-overs. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I think uh, the demonstration effect, the test of congressional support and presidential will power is something you hear about in Japan. So, so what happens next? Um, we have possibly a window until recess, possibly a window after the midterms, maybe next year. How do you see the TPA, TPP debate unfolding? Well, I'll start with, with you because you're on the Ways and Means right. Committee. Well, we've been, uh, we've been really, uh, we, were, we were really hopeful last year that the president was going to make a strong push for trade promotion authority because really this is, this is part of what ultimately would be a big part of his legacy, a big positive part of his legacy, uh, as it was for Bill Clinton. Uh, and, uh, you know, but the problem is, is that there's been just this lack of understanding that you've got to work closely with the Congress in order to get things passed. And as, as you said, it's, it's much different in Japan where they can make things happen. Here you got to, you know, we're all individuals. We, we disagree. You know, we all, you know, we both represent 700,000 people. So uh, the key is, is can you get 218 votes in the Senate and 60 votes, or two, uh, 218 votes in the House and 60 votes in the Senate? And the, the, the president finally mentioned it in his State of the Union address, uh, the, uh, the need to pass trade promotion authority. Uh, and then 12 hours later, you had the, you know, no, arguably the number two Democrat in the country, the leader of the Senate, Harry Reid, came out and said, well, we're not gonna move trade promotion authority. And so, you know, we're, we're, I actually fault the United States. I think we're being a very irresponsible partner uh, in terms of, of being able to negotiate uh, out and finish this agreement. And, uh, and the blame uh, really lies with the Senate because the House is ready to move the bill. But we're not gonna move the bill until, the, until Harry Reid is gonna move the bill. You know, we, we need to have uh, some kind of agreement that, that we put politics aside and for the betterment of the global economy uh, that we move forward on this on these this trade agenda. Congressman, are you optimistic about TPP? Uh, well, you know, it, it depends on the deal that's struck. Um, you know, if you ask the question, will will this trade agreement pass? It depends on the deal that you know ultimately is made. And of course, uh, you know, TPP has not been put down in writing in a bill, uh, so that's hard to predict. Um, you know, what you do have. Uh, well, first of all, I think. The issue with TPA, it's a traditional issue between the Congress, the legislative branch, and the executive branch. Uh, it's not just on this issue, but many other issues. And certainly not just with this president, but many presidents and congresses before. Um, and so, uh, you know, you have obviously Democratic concerns about incorporating the May 10th uh, provisions, about strengthening labor and environmental provisions. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, but I would also point out um, that on the right, in the Republican Party, um, you have a group of folks within the Tea Party now that you didn't have in previous, in most of the previous free trade agreements, uh, who are generally not as supportive of trade uh, as what you, know, you would consider pro-business Republicans. So there is a new dynamic, I think, politically that needs to be considered. Um, you know, the, the, the concerns on the left or among Democrats are fairly consistent, but I do think you have this new dynamic on the right uh, that was not factored in in previous agreements. On the whole, <clears throat> do you both think, um, with, there's a lot of ifs in this, but if there's a good deal, if there's <clears throat> movement on trade promotion authority, you know, if, if, if the political leadership is done in the Congress and the administration, uh, do you think there's 
sufficient support to well, let me Well, let me answer it this way just so I can make sure that I don't want to leave anything uh, to chance on this. We're going to get uh, a TPP agreement ultimately. Uh, the challenge is going to be, I think, whether or not President Obama is going to get it done or whether the next President of the United States is going to get it done. I mean, that's what we're really up to now. And so uh, the President is in, is in a great position. Um, you know, he could start making moves now, perhaps if he can't do it before the election, he could start putting something together, working with the Congress to maybe get something in the lame duck. Um, but if not, if you start to leak past this year, then you get into the crazy times of presidential primaries, and you'll, you know, you'll have people all over the map on this, and I think it will become very difficult to pass TPA that then gets us to, which is what we need to get to TPP. Uh, but, uh, but I do believe ultimately there's a commitment by, uh, by all the parties involved uh, that we're going to get this done. I just hope it's sooner rather than later. Um, lest our <clears throat> friends in the Japanese media um, write a headline out of this panel saying Congress decides it's all on Congress and the President, let's put the <laughs> burden on Prime Minister Abe in Japan a little bit. What do you think uh, uh, Japan has to do? You, you both mentioned that the surge in interest has a lot to do with Prime Minister Abe and his steady hand on the tiller, but also Japan joining TPP, that's a very big deal. And the joke is, without Japan, TPP is a free trade agreement with Brunei. I mean, this, 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 this makes this very, very real. So um, maybe you could each say something about uh, what this would mean for Japan, as you see it, in terms of relations with the U.S. Japanese economy. Congressman? Sure. Uh, well, I think, you know, uh, our relationship with Japan as it exists now and, and as it's existed for decades from the 1960s a security agreement, for example, um, you know, ours is a very strong, solid relationship, uh, and it's also larger than this agreement, whether, it's, whether there's TPP or not. However, um, certainly I think that it would increase trade and economic productivity between the two nations. Um, and I think, you know, Japan, just like the U.S. and all the other countries that are parties to the agreement, um, are going to have to take a, a, a long, hard, introspective look uh, at what they're willing to commit uh, in terms of tariffs and prices, uh, which industries are willing to you know, allow free trade in. Um, and those are very difficult and tough things for all the countries involved. Uh, and certainly with Japan, you know, some of their fundamental industries are going to have to you know, really think about those and how much they're willing to open them up. Mm -hmm. Congressman. Well, we really pushed for Japan and Canada and Mexico uh, to get in because we knew it would make it such a bigger, such a, a, a bigger agreements better in terms of because if we can actually make make TPP WTO plus as I started out to begin with, then that leads to the EU agreement, and you know all of these are combined. This is why it's so important, I think, for for not only the Congress but also the legacy of of the Obama uh, of President Obama's time in the White House. But you're talking about two-thirds of, of the world's GDP really being under a WTO plus system. And, you know, from my perspective, WTO is barely functionable, barely functionable. And there's a, you know, it, it allows for a lot of bad actors and a lot of lawyers to make a lot of money and nothing ever happens. Uh, and so this type of agreement is so critical. I think as you, as you look towards specifically to your question on Japan, uh, you know, they're, they're going to have to be willing to put everything on the table. Uh, I have said uh, numerous times that I think it's <coughs> fine to have certain products where we're all, we're all sensitive to certain products of, you know, both the U.S. regionally uh, and Japan is too. We understand that. But a free trade agreement is not a free trade agreement if you don't get rid of tariffs. Mm -hmm. And so I understand needing time but to have some products that don't go to zero is a little bit silly. So, I mean, there is, there is a, you know, if, if Japan is not willing to make those tough decisions, uh, you know, we may end up with an agreement with Brunei. You know, it's, <clears throat> the, both negotiating teams have been pretty good about keeping this quiet, um, but it seems like we're down to a few, maybe five agricultural sectors in Japan, and autos and a few other things. <clears throat> um, and it'd be, a, it'd be a real shame and a, and a bit of an embarrassment and a loss for both countries if we let that um, stop what you're describing, which is a 21st century standard 
uh, trade agreement that not only encompasses with you and when you include TTIP, <coughs> um, you know, most of the um, WTO members, um, but really puts a, uh, a high mark for China uh, in particular, but also India as they reform their economies. So it's really quite critical. And I, I know we all appreciate your, your, uh, your active engagement on, on this. <coughs> Let me turn to security. Um, the president gave very robust uh, statements in every stop on security. Um, in Japan, in particular, uh, about the Senkaku or Diaoyu Thai Islands. <coughs> um, we, since the Cold War, um, I was in the Bush administration, but it was true for Clinton as well, we've, we've tried to expand cooperation and engagement with China, uh, but at the same time, uh, keep our allies close um, uh, and expand our partnerships so that the rules in Asia are um, uh, the right rules, that, uh, that China's coming in as, as a partner, not as a, as a revisionist player trying to change things. So, <clears throat> pretty hard balancing act. The Chinese government seems pretty unhappy with the president's trip. Um, I think I'll start with Congressman Castro uh, mm -hmm. this time, but um, how do you think you get that, that balance right? Um, we're not containing China. We're trying to cooperate with China, but we yeah. stand by our allies. How, sure. do you, how, do you, how do you think you get that, that mix right? Uh, well, I, I think the president struck a good balance, you know. Um, I mean, look, you, you have in Japan and China two countries that the United States um, is very actively engaged with uh, as trading partners, um, a security agreement and a longstanding <coughs> relationship with Japan. Um, so as you mentioned, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you're going to reassure your allies, uh, especially those that you have a specific agreement with, uh, that you're going to be there to support them. And I think that's what he did. Um, you know, uh, that said, I mean, of course, you know, we're strong economic partners with China. Um, and so they're obviously very important to our economy. Um, the United States also has a very important role to play in easing the tensions, I think, in that region. Uh, you mentioned the incursion on the Senkaku Islands. Um, you know, also bringing our allies together, Japan and South <coughs> Korea, uh, who have very similar interests as it relates to China. Um, you know, concerns about North Korea. Uh, and so, yeah, it was great to see the president there uh, visiting all those countries and being very hands-on uh, not only with respect to trade, but also with respect to security aspects. Well, I think you, through economic security comes uh, security. And if that's why it's so critical, I think, to get this TPP done, because it really then puts, it forces, I think, ultimately China to the table. And the Chinese know that, the Chinese government knows that. Um, you know, a lot of the, even the, some of the officials that I've spoke to have admitted that from, from China. So uh, that's why, you know, for the betterment of the entire uh, world, we need to see this, see this get done. Um, I think as you, it's hard for us as Americans uh, to really look at that region and have a, uh, you know, a real understanding of it unless you are a, you know, scholar of the, uh, of the region because, you know, this is, these, these societies go back, they have a, thousands of years, um, and it becomes very difficult because, you, you know, the Japanese and the Koreans and the Chinese have been, and other regions have been at war for, you know, several, you know, many times, and, you know, you go back to World War II, was, wasn't that long ago. Uh, China was our ally and Japan wasn't. So, uh, you know, we just want to make sure that over the long run that we, that we create these, these economic ties uh, and then we hope that at some point uh, that, that China's, uh, you know, kind of communist theocracy, I guess is, is all you can call it. I mean, it's kind of a, a it's really becoming a, a country of a lot of really rich people at the very top. And you know they've basically given up on, on kind of Marxist communism, uh, but they need to open up their economy. They need to open up their political system, and the sooner they can do that, the better. And I think the sooner that we forge strong economic partnerships and a strong defensive partnership, it's going to hopefully open up the the eyes of the Chinese to actually join the rest of the world. <coughs> That's been the key to our success when we've gotten it right for a hundred years. It's the the navy, the trading system we bring in our values. Um, it's interesting, you, you, you mentioned earlier when we were in, um, backstage that the members of the caucus are not all from Hawaii and California and Washington <laughs> State. They're from all, from landlocked, you know, San Antonio, I mean, from all over the country. 
<clears throat> and in public opinion polls, I guess over the last three, four years or so, when Americans are asked what region of the world is most important, they used to say Europe for decades, now they say Asia. <clears throat> when asked in a lot of polling what country do you trust the most, um, after Britain, Canada, Australia, you know, the, the cousins, uh, Japan ranks very, very high. So uh, there's a lot of at least instinctive understanding, even if everyone's not a scholar of the history of the Asia Pacific region. Well, and as you pointed out, Mike, at the beginning, you know, that is, uh, we've come such a long way from the 1980s where there really was this worry that Japan was going to take over America by buying everything up, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. um, the relationship economically has, has evolved incredibly, um, and there is a, an incredible sense of cooperation among the two countries. And then to Devin's point, I think, um, you know, I do get the sense that with this trade agreement, uh, more than previous trade agreements, um, there is a sense that geopolitics is also at stake in a way that I didn't sense before. Mm -hmm. um, not only because of the Asia pivot, but also because, because China is, is, you know, such a powerful uh, nation in that, in that part of the world and emerging obviously as a powerful player in the rest of the world. Um, and to the extent that you have engagements, economic engagements with other nations there, um, you know, what kind of position does it put the United States in vis-a-vis -vis China? Let me ask a uh, last question, then we'll turn it over to the audience. <clears throat> Something that puzzles not just average Americans, but you know, scholars and experts on the region is the state of the Japan-Korea relationship. Hmm. Two close allies, two countries with very pro-US attitudes, two countries the American people respect, two democracies, but man, um, very, very tough political racial relations right now. And unfortunately for you all, that spills over into the US Congress because we have a lot of Korean Americans. Um, do you have thoughts on this? Is there a way the caucus can help? Is there a way Congress can help? Should the Congress just stay out of it? Um, uh, we can't, in my view, s solve these problems between uh, two friends, but we might be able to help on the margins or something. Well, I think we try to help, uh, but sometimes, uh, I think more often than not, uh, we get involved when we could make things worse. Uh, so, uh, you know, currently I know that the uh, State Department has the, I forget the name, but it's like a, a meeting of the three where they get Tribal, together, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, some kind of commission, um, you know, at least where people are at the table talking. Uh, obviously, you know, that's something that, that we can always push forward. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's as I said earlier, right? I mean, there's so much history there uh, and a lot of bad history uh, in terms of, you know, a lot of people were killed on both sides and, and, and a, lot of, a lot of issues that, uh, that, that we won't go into. But, uh, you know, you still have that ever growing or ever uh, never ending problem of North Korea. And until we take care of North Korea, uh, it's going to continue to be a problem. But that's not easy either, right? You've got 30 million people roughly, you got four or five million North Koreans that actually have food, the rest are kind of living as savages. And uh, it, you know, it's one of the starkest things I've ever seen, just some of the pictures that I've seen. I've, if you've ever been to the North-South Korea border, uh, somebody that's from agriculture like myself, uh, to see where you know, entire mountains are just stripped of everything is quite a uh, it's, it's one of the, the most lasting images in my mind of something I've, I've seen in person uh, as someone who's, you know, who's growing up in, in agriculture and farming uh, to see a whole mountainside just stripped, mm -hmm. you know, meaning that you know, they were eating and burning anything that they could just to, just to stay, stay warm. So, you know, what's the, what's the solution to the South North Korea uh, issue? You know, I don't know, we've been there for a long time, we've got 25,000 troops sitting there. Uh, and I think until you kind of solve that, it makes it tougher to solve the bigger problems. It does focus the mind, the North Korea problem. And uh, there are rumors, reports that a fourth nuclear test is in the offing and uh, that will clarify thinking among right. ourselves, the Japanese and Koreans. Sure. Um, no, I would just <laughs> add that, you know, during President Obama's term, uh, he was the first President, I believe, to arrange an in-person meeting between the leaders of the two nations. Um, there are, of course, you know, historical sensitivities between the two, and that's something ultimately that they have to resolve on their own. Um, but that's the case with other nations throughout the world, too. Um, and so it's not just Japan and South Korea. Um, 
but we ought to do everything that we can, whether it's at the executive level through the president or through the Congress, to try to facilitate the relationship between Japan and South Korea, because they are both strong allies, uh, and they both have, they both share uh, deep concerns about others in the region. And if we get TPP done with Japan and the 12 current uh, partners, it's a pretty good chance that uh, South Korea is going to lock in based on the U.S. Uh, Korea, Chorus, FTA as well, so we'll have a lot in common. Um, I think we have microphones, and I'm happy to ask questions. Kushima-san, <laughs> Glenn Fukushima in the front right here. I'm uh, Glenn Fukushima with the Center for American Progress. I have a question for each of the members of Congress. Uh, first for Congressman Castro, um, can you tell us what specifically you think the, the caucus can do to uh, specifically further U.S.-Japan relations, in particular what I'm thinking about? is can we expect the, con uh, the caucus, for instance, to take a leadership role in getting TPA passed so that uh, we can go on with the TPP? I mean, what, what specifically, say, over the next two or three years can we expect from the caucus in terms of uh, promoting U.S.-Japan relations? And for Congressman Nunes, I'm uh, from California, and uh, I used to work at USTR actually back uh, in the 1980s, and uh, Mike Green and Matthew Goodman were student interns in my office at the time, so I'm very yeah. pleased to be here today. Um, I feel very old. But um, <laughs> my specific question is the following. When I was at USTR from 85 to 90, it was during the Reagan and the Bush administrations, when we had trade negotiations with Japan, usually the pattern was that the Congress would put pressure on the administration and on Japan so that the administration could conclude trade agreements, which often were very difficult, very contentious. What I heard you saying is that you're putting the blame on not concluding TPP <coughs> on the administration, which makes, the, makes it very difficult for the administration. On the trip that the president took to uh, Asia, and I happened to be in Japan at that time, I was a bit concerned because it seemed that uh, Mr. Abe, president, Prime Minister Abe pretty much got everything he wanted from the president in terms of Senkaku, in terms of collective self-defense, uh, a number of other things that I think that uh, <coughs> Mr. Abe was uh, seeking to get. The president got almost nothing out of that trip, it seemed. Um, I think it, it might have been reasonable to expect that Japan would make some significant uh, concessions so that a breakthrough could be reached on TPP. Not a final conclusion, but some major breakthrough. What, what responsibility do you think Japan has to uh, go the extra mile to conclude the agreement without you know, putting all the blame on the administration? Thank you. Sure. Well, uh, <coughs> I think that uh, the caucus can be a facilitator of conversations between the administration and the rest of Congress. Uh, of course, there's the committee that's also committed to that, uh, that will take up the bill. Um, you know, part of the concern uh, among members of Congress with the administration, and, and I should say that Ambassador Froman has gone out of his way um, to make presentations to members of Congress, both individually and in groups, uh, but part of the concern has been um, the disclosure on TPP and not being able to, you know, people want to be able to read these things, uh, and it's been kind of let out in sections. Um, but I think that, you know, the caucus can play a role in facilitating those discussions. Um, yeah. And, you know, and I think at, at base, I think the role of the caucus is also to highlight the importance of Japan and the American economy. Uh, the more that folks throughout the Congress appreciate the role that Japan plays in their, our economy, uh, I think the more supportive they will be of trade with Japan generally. I would, I would add to that, too, that uh, the other caucuses that I've been uh, involved with, uh, it really gives the, the country uh, meaning the, the, the country like, uh, in this case, Japan, it gives them uh, a great way to get access into the Congress. So a lot of times what Joaquin and I find ourselves doing is we have a lot of meetings uh, that we set up uh, with, our, with our counterparts from Japan. So today I know that we're meeting with, I think, two delegations that are coming in uh, this afternoon. And so I think it makes it really easy to have to have kind of a common, friendly group of folks that will help, even if we disagree with our Japanese friends, at least they have an entree uh, to get set up the right meetings. Because a lot of times, uh, and we find ourselves when we visit other foreign countries, you know, we don't necessarily know who exactly it is that we need to meet with. So a lot of times, if we have a delegation coming in, we'll try to make sure that they meet with the right, either somebody within the executive branch or, uh, or in the legislative branch. Uh, as it relates to uh, the, the agreement, uh, I think I was, I was pretty clear on what the Japanese need to do. 
uh, and that is that uh, I can understand without TPA why it's hard to bring a, an agreement to conclusion uh, because I don't believe that we want to put uh, any of our friends and <coughs> allies that are part of TPP that all have to, we understand what it is to run for, for office, trade agreements can be beat up by both sides, uh, and if you end up with uh, something that, that gets out there and it sits, well then it becomes a punching bag for, for politicians. That, I'm sure that's the same case in Japan and many of our other uh, countries in the TPP. Uh, but I will say that, uh, you know, just state it again, uh, we're not going to have an, an agreement that's going to leave a bunch of products on the sidelines as it relates to tariffs. Time is good, but getting to zero is most important. And, uh, and I think until, until we get TPA, it's going to be tough to get those final agreements because I think once we get the agreement, then we've got to make sure that it gets to all of, uh, all of the respective governments to make sure it gets passed, signed into law, implemented. I should add that although Matt Goodman and I were interns for Glenn in the U.S. China in the 1980s, we were not personally responsible for the trade wars, <coughs> <laughs> mostly. Um, and this, this narrative is very curious that somehow I find myself as a former Bush White House guy rising in defense of President Obama, but I find this narrative that he was tricked curious because the statement on the Senkaku was on the security treaty and on collective self-defense on its own merits was in U.S. interests. Um, and people often forget uh, one of the most important things on the president's agenda right now, uh, Ukraine and Crimea, you know, Prime Minister Abe has signed up. It's the US, EU, and Japan. <clears throat> but that narrative's out there. It, it definitely is. You hear it quite a bit. Um, yes, sir, right there. I mean, if you, I mean, keep coming. And then there. Thanks. Uh, Pei Xu from A Voice of America. Uh, while uh, President Obama's remarks during his uh, uh, Japan trip, uh, over the Senkakus and the DLUs uh, made some J Japanese, made Tokyo very happy and uh, Beijing very unhappy. But before uh, I came to th uh, this conference, I read a, a long article in the Japanese uh, business journal, Japanese uh, business press. Uh, telling the Japanese, oh, don't get too complacent, don't get too happy. The, the, uh, President Obama repeat, repeatedly said that uh, his remarks over the Senkakus are not new at all. The Japanese, uh, U.S.-Japanese security treaty uh, covers the Senkakus, uh, uh, covers the Senkakus. And uh, in the treaty, it said that uh, the U.S. will react to that tax uh, on the Japan uh, on the territories territories under Japanese uh, administration according to the U.S. according to each country's constitution, and the article warned that that means the promise or the President Obama's remarks about the Senkakus do not necessarily mean that the U.S. will immediately, automatically come to defend Japan when the Senkakus are under tax. It all depends on the U.S. Congress because U.S. Congress That's has the authority to declare. And you want the Congressman's reaction to yeah. that? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Well, I would say that uh, at the end of the day, if the Chinese continue to uh, do these uh, incursions and, and uh, uh, continue to run roughshod in, uh, uh, in the South China Sea, I think you're going to end up, you know, they don't want to push us too far, and I think ultimately the Chinese will not. Uh, but I thought the president was, was pretty clear uh, and, and I think precise that, you know, none of us want to have this conflict. Uh, the Chinese are obviously, uh, you know, they're poking the beehive for some reason. Uh, I wish they would stop, uh, but they seem to be uh, uh, really <coughs> promoting nationalism, uh, and uh, which is fine, but it, it just seems like it's counterproductive to what we really need to see in a, in a global economy. Uh, but uh, I, I didn't have any problem with, uh, with uh, President Obama, I think, 
you know, drew a, a, a pretty clear picture of what we would do and not do? Uh, I th the most important thing the United States can do in the region is to make sure that tensions don't flare up to the point where it becomes necessary to take action. Uh, and I think the President's trip was part of that. Um, and, you know, you know, as I said, we, as all of us know, we have deep relationships with China also, uh, economically. Um, and so, you know, but I think the President was clear that you know, the United States will defend Japan. Um, technically, the, the U.S. Congress is supposed to approve every military action uh, that is taken. Uh, but, you know, as is custom, uh, a United States president, not just this one, but presidents in prior years, um, you know, are very clear about what our commitments are to other countries and to our allies. And I think President Obama uh, made that clear. No, none of our security treaties, none of them, not with NATO, not with Korea, none of them trigger automatic reactions. The commander in chief, the president, and the Congress have a role, and it's true for the right. prime minister and the Japanese diet. Um, I had a question over here. Thank you. Steve Landy, Manchester Trade. I have one short question on Japan and one short question on agenda for the, for the current Congress. Um, having been involved in trade negotiations since 1960, so you go back a little bit, and still getting over the shock of Ambassador Strauss, who was such a leader and is no longer with us, unfortunately, and so on. My feeling is that most negotiations go on and on and then there's a deal made. I think the U.S. Achilles heel in terms of agriculture is our position on sugar. And as you know on sugar, we did not go to zero duty with the Australians and so on. Uh, Australia just made agreement with Japan. So I think that will be resolved and so on. But I'm kind of curious. My more general agenda question is that I'm also concerned about Chairman Camp's legacy as I am with Mr. Obama's legacy. And I'm trying to figure out what we can do in this session of Congress that we can do, particularly if TPP is and TPA are delayed until lame duck or something like that. And the one issue which I think is ripe for the plucking is AGOA. There has just been a study by the USITC. African Union has come out with a study. They talk about what has to be done. It's the only one of the few bipartisan issues that people can focus on. We have a threat from Japan, from who? A, a threat from China. I'm back in the 1970s. A threat from China and a threat from the European Union with their preferential agreements. Is there any chance that you could consider perhaps having a hearing on a go, since we now have this US ITC report maybe in June? So once we have that hearing, then it becomes part of the congressional melee and we can move forward. And as you know, your committee has always been the hero of AGOA. And so on, the Trade Subcommittee really is more responsible, people don't say it too often, than Bill Clinton's administration, nothing against Bill Clinton's administration, but pro-trade. So I was curious, is there any chance about all of these things happening that maybe we might have a hearing in June and then we could really ro roll up? If we do not renew AGOA this year, we will have the same disruption to, US, to African exports in textiles as we had a couple of years ago. So it should be done this year. And we have the Obama summit to push us along. Thank you. Well, you must be, I guess I'll answer this question since it's a ways <laughs> means question. Uh, you must be sneaking into our meetings or something. There must be some leaks, I think, because uh, uh, we're planning on having uh, an AGOA hearing later in the year uh, this summer. Um, and I actually think that trade has become, even over my time in, in Congress, has become a very bipartisan issue. Um, you see more and more uh, Democrats supporting trade, and you see the American people supporting trade. Uh, as it relates uh, you know, directly to AGOA, we've got a number of, of issues that are languishing uh, in terms of, of GSP, of uh, the MTB, miscellaneous tariffs uh, bill, uh, not to mention, obviously, we've already talked about TPA. Uh, these are all uh, issues that need to be dealt with by the, by the Congress. And, uh, and, I, and it is the responsibility of the Congress to get some of these done. Uh, but you have to have a push sometimes, and especially by the leaders of both parties, to push people in the direction that they need to get to to do the right thing for the American people. <laughs> And uh, not to belabor this anymore, but, uh, but I just think that, th that there is a big divide between you know, the White House and the, and the Senate, which is, creates problems. Oh, sugar, uh, yeah, I agree. I mean, I think it is, I think you, you hit it on the head. I think it is an Achilles heel, but uh, you know, that was a prior agreement. Uh, so uh, you know, I don't think you will see anything similar 
Uh, you're not seeing the U.S. pushing a similar policy with any of the other countries that I'm aware of. Yeah, and I would just point out, you know, uh, on this issue and many others that have nothing to do with trade or the U.S. or Japan, I think, you know, one of the deepest challenges in getting things done this year uh, is that after July 31st, the last five months of the year, we're in session 26 days for the last five months of the year. Um, so, you know, for example, people in Texas ask me about immigration reform uh, or tax reform, and I tell them, um, you know, it's going to be tough after July 31st because uh, you know, we're in session two days here, three days here, uh, and then, you know, we're off all of August, we're back home in our districts, we're back home in our districts in October because it's an election year, uh, and then you've got the holidays. Uh, so if there's something that you want to push, you got to push it now. Uh, yes, you want to start? Hi, my name is Kanji Yamanocha. I'm the uh, Minister for the Economic Affairs of the Japanese Embassy, and I really appreciate today's discussion. And today's discussion is pr pr pretty much focusing on the trade and security. So I would like to take up the new sort of angle of the U.S.-Japan relations. And actually, the, uh, the when President Obama visited Tokyo and issued a joint statement and fact sheet, and they put sort of the, uh, uh, bring the new perspective of the U.S.-Japan cooperation on global agendas like a global warming, women's empowerment, and development. And those issues are also very important for our two countries to focusing on to help the country. Uh, in need, and there's a much possibility for the uh, uh, widening and deepening our alliance. So I would like to ask you a comment on those issues. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so the, the president's joint statement with the prime minister included a big focus on global issues, women's empowerment, climate change, uh, development. Sure. Yeah. And what is that part of the agenda for the caucus or something you'd like to turn to? Oh, sure. No, absolutely. And, you know, and one of the wonderful things that Prime Minister Abe has done is his womenomics initiative in Japan in getting, getting more women into the workforce. Um, and, you know, of course, we, we still battle with some of those issues here in the United States, uh, but certainly on energy issues uh, and, and energy development, uh, that's very important. So, you know, I think, I think the caucus will be taking on not just trade issues, but also a host of issues where the nations can find common ground. Well, and as I said earlier, I mean, the, really the key to the caucus is not necessarily you are always going to have, a, we'll agree, we'll disagree, as all of us do in the, in the Congress. And this is not, uh, it shouldn't be seen as, uh, as like a lobbying arm for, for uh, you know, certain issues. Uh, really, if anything, it's just a, it, it, it allows for Japan and the U.S., to have a, a, a cordial and interactive relationship with, with the two, between the two governments. And that's how I see our role primarily. Not, it's not necessarily issue specific. We'll leave that to the, to the people that are supposed to do that. We, we have enough problems on our own. <laughs> so the, the real opportunity is convening power. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like but both <clears throat> uh, between uh, uh, Japanese parliamentarians, very important, the uh, parliamentarian link is, is critical between two allies that are democracies, and it's atrophied a bit uh, sure. over the years. <clears throat> um, but also it sounds like with um, uh, the scholarly community, um, economic groups, uh, it's really the, the focus that you both bring and the 70 and hopefully pr presumably more members to this relationship and getting people to focus on a range of these issues. I'd add uh, proliferation. I mean, the US and Japan signed a very important deal on controlling plutonium in the Hague, so there's a lot of uh, a lot of stuff. I'm, I'm not trying to make you nervous with your 26 days between now and the end yeah. of the year, but there are a lot of things you can work on. Please, right here. Thank you. Um, Jessa Bonner from Public Citizen. I also have a question about uh, trade promotion authority. It's a hot topic. Um, 60 members of Congress recently sent a letter to the Obama administration um, calling for full elimination of agricultural tariffs under the TPP. Um, and I think these are 60 members of Congress that the administration is counting on uh, for support for trade promotion authority, given that there has been um, some opposition. I think 151 uh, Democrats in the House and some Republicans have voiced opposition. Um, but Prime Minister Abe, I think it's under a lot of political pressure um, and has kind of rejected uh, elimination of agricultural tariffs. So I guess my question is, do you think um, it's possible to get TPA without the first getting the elimination of agricultural tariffs in Japan? Thanks. Well, I, I 
I think you mean uh, to get a TPP finished. I think you said TPA, but um, I just don't feel all the, the countries can actually put their best deal on the table until TPA is done. That there's some, that there's some reassurance that, that ultimately the, uh, the legislation or the agreements will get ratified by the, the, all the countries involved, all the parties involved. Uh, as it relates to, uh, it's not just agriculture, uh, but I think, you know, this is, we have no uh, interest in going backwards in, uh, in these trade agreements. And I think if you start to leave products off, uh, it, that would be going backwards in my opinion. So uh, obviously we're continuing, we're, we're looking on the readouts uh, from the meetings. We'll be meeting with USTR. Uh, and then those of us that are involved in, in trade specifically on the Ways and Means Committee, uh, we'll be going back with recommendations to the administration on how to proceed. Um, we have time for one last very quick question. Um, yes. Thank you, Congressman, for doing this. And thank you very much, Mr. Green, for this opportunity. My name is Wada. I'm with Japan's Mainz newspaper. And my question is about uh, the Caucasus role. Do you have any particular ideas about what you are going to do in the field of Japan US security cooperation? Any um, concrete projects? And also, uh, if you have any opinion about this recent discussion in Japan about whether the country should be allowed to use the right to collective self-defense. That's my question, thank you. Sure, um, well, let, me, let me take the latter question first. Um, you know, I believe the United States sees it as a positive step uh, that Japan would be able to have more uh, military authority uh, beyond what they've had since World War II. Um, in the second part, of your first part uh, on the caucus, uh, you know, as Devin mentioned, I think you know, there are different things that we can do. We, we have an opportunity to convene people we have an opportunity to receive Japanese delegations and also report back to our members about those meetings um, and also to highlight the issues that are important between our two nations um, and, and communicate with the administration what we're hearing from our members. Uh, and so that's the role that we intend to play um, as that kind of intermediary, um, you know, as these issues come up. Yeah, uh, and I, I actually uh, agree uh, in terms of on the defense side, that uh, it, it's helpful if Japan could uh, add, uh, as you see China continuing to build uh, their military apparatus. Uh, you know, we don't want to, we don't, unfortunately, we don't want to be in this military buildup uh, type of scenario, but uh, because the Chinese continue to do it, I think it's helpful that the Japanese uh, can make sure that they can build some deterrence of their, of their own. Uh, obviously in conjunction with the existing security relationship that we have. And uh, as it relates uh, to the caucus, uh, I, I think just to, just to say it one more time, the key is, is, is to have a, uh, uh, an open uh, door policy uh, between the two governments. You know, a lot of these caucuses are sometimes called the, I think, uh, like I chair the co-chair of the Mexico caucus, which we call the U.S.-Mexico Friendship Caucus. And you know, I think that's a, a good way to put it. I mean, this is really about friends being able to get together. I want to thank you both um, for coming today and for your leadership in forming this caucus. Um, you clearly have command of the relationship, and uh, you're going to help um, bring a lot of people on board in the Congress. Matt Goodman and I both grew up inside the Beltway. We've been passionate about Japan since we were since we were kids, but we, we, this is a bit of a bubble, <laughs> as I'm sure you know. And uh, this caucus, I have a feeling, is going to play a really important role, not just inside the Beltway, but, but really deepening the roots across the country. It's very interesting, as I said, that you have members, not just from the West Coast, but all across uh, the US. So um, kudos and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.